Hi, Jean Schnupp here. Welcome to another of the Savvy Sightseer video vacation series and entry number two to my bucket list, Northern Ireland. This series fleshes out the places I'd like to visit when the time comes to travel. I'm doing my research now so I will know more about a place and why it interests me and then I can be on the next plane out with my list of not to miss sites. Although I've been to the island of Ireland many times, like a lot of other tourists, I never got past the independent Republic of Ireland and into the north, which is part of the United Kingdom. Thus, Northern Ireland, with its rich history and dramatic coastline, is on my bucket list. And I owe a debt of gratitude to friends who shared their own pictures and recollections for this program. We'll make a grand loop of the region, starting with Belfast, its capital and largest city. Titanic Belfast is an amazing museum there, dedicated to the ill-fated ship built in the city, and now the most expensive tourism project ever completed in Northern Ireland. We'll take in breathtaking sights, such as the Mountains of Mourne, which have been saluted in song by artists including Don McLean and Celtic Thunder. We'll also stop by the Giant's Causeway, a geologic wonder, or perhaps a pedestrian bridge to Scotland for Giants. We'll also see why enthralling views were showcased in many of the scenes in the HBO series Game of Thrones. We'll go deep into underground caves at Marble Arch, then stop in at Belik, where beautiful fine china has been crafted for over 160 years. We'll head to the split personality city of Derry, Londonderry, where we'll stand atop the mile-long wall surrounding the last completely fortified city in Ireland. And of course, we'll roam in the footsteps of St. Patrick, Ireland's patron saint who is buried on the East Coast. Time to get your green on and let's get going. This magnificent building is Belfast City Hall, from which the whole city radiates. It was designed in the late 1890s to be a grand symbol of the newly minted city. Belfast had come a long way from a sprawling village in the 1600s largely involved in brick, rope, net, and sailcloth making, to be a major linen industry center in the early 1700s, until finally being bestowed city status in 1888 by Queen Victoria. It continued progressing to become one of the world's leading industrial cities with a world-class shipbuilding industry. In the early 21st century, Belfast is a thriving city, and in the words of one resident, Belfast has blossomed. The city, by the way, became a gateway in 1942 for American soldiers entering World War II. On January 26, 37,000 American troops disembarked in Belfast, the first U.S. soldiers deployed overseas after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. A tour through the hall is a good way to get acquainted with the city and its history. An elevator whisks visitors to the top of the dome for 360 degree views. A not-to-be-missed feature is one that sets this City Hall building apart from most others. Its collection of stained glass windows, some original to the building and others added later. According to the City Council, these reflect the cultural views of all living in Belfast and show that the building is a City Hall for all. One of the more recent additions you see here in the upper left of the screen. This is the 2016 Belfast Women's Window which was installed to commemorate their contribution to culture, industry, and society, and to highlight their struggle for equality. Below that is Celtic Myths and Legends. It shows the cattle raid of Cooley, one of the most famous tales in Celtic mythology. To its right is the Spanish Civil War window, which marks the contribution of Belfast citizens who fought against Franco's forces in the 1930s. Next is the Famine window, remembering one of Ireland's greatest disasters and its impact on the city, citizens of Belfast. Symbols include a woman in a graveyard, a starving father and daughter who are weeping over a boiling pot, and a woman and child toiling away in a field searching for edible potatoes. The emigrant ship represents the escape taken by those who could afford a ticket to the new world. And on the right, the centenary window is a celebration of local successes and achievements over the course of a hundred years in such fields as ship and airplane building, sport, music, engineering, and literature. 
Some of Northern Ireland's more well-known exports to the U.S. include author C.S. Lewis from the Chronicles of Narnia and musician Van Morrison, known for Brown Eyed Girl, and actor Liam Neeson for Schindler's List, among many other movies. I have noticed that newer museums are being purpose-built. They are not mere warehouses of information. Their designs are a part of the story and are well thought out to be an exhibit in and of themselves. Such is the case with Titanic Belfast, opened in the spring of 2012. In 1911, the so-called unsinkable Titanic, built by Harland and Wolf Limited, left its berth in Belfast to spend time being luxuriously outfitted nearby. History was made when the 852-foot-long ship sank along with many of its famous and wealthy passengers nearly a year later in the frigid North Atlantic. Titanic Belfast is the world's largest museum devoted to the ship and its history. The building has over 3,000 different shaped aluminum, or as the British say, aluminum, sheets that are folded into complicated shapes, leaning out at angles up to 72 degrees, creating a startlingly random effect, always managing to catch the light, a bit like a cut diamond. The architect, Texas native, Eric Kuhn, said he was inspired by and incorporated many nautical symbols into the design's visual effects. The shape of water crystals, just as they are about to freeze, became the texture of the facades. The peculiar form of icebergs led to the shape of the glass observatories. Ship's bows and the White Star corporate logo are also incorporated. The interior plan is based on a maritime rose. With a total cost in excess of a hundred million pounds, Titanic Belfast is the most expensive tourism project ever completed in Northern Ireland. It has nine interactive galleries through which visitors can explore artifacts and models. Computer imagery illustrates the ship's opulent interior. Visitors can even take a high-tech ride that sweeps along a 1911 Belfast street down through the gates of Harland and Wolfe and then down right among the workers. The shipyard's noises and smells are meticulously recreated. Visitors can feel a part of the excitement being among the 100,000 spectators who turned out to watch the mighty ship leave its slip when it was launched May 31, 1911. The museum depicts more than just the saga of the Titanic, though. Its wider theme encompasses Belfast's industrial age, and the building's four points represent the ages of the shipbuilding's legacy in the city, timber, iron, steel, and aluminum. Titanic Belfast, according to the architect, stands today as a testimony of all these elements that have made Belfast the center of shipbuilding in the world. The industrial age was not only changing the face of big cities like Belfast, but equally opened nature to the masses, such as the case with a pathway not far from central Belfast that is known as the Gobbins, from an Irish term meaning the tip or point of land. Berkeley Wise, an engineer for the Belfast and Northern Con Counties Railway Company, saw the growth of a rail system not just to transport goods, but as a means for locals to venture away from city life to truly appreciate Ireland's dramatic and beautiful coasts. Wise envisioned the steam engine's ability to quickly transport people as a way to open up remote beauty spots to a new kind of industry, tourism, and with a build it and they will come business frame of mind. In 1902, he created a daring pathway area on the East Coast. The railway organized various excursion trips to such beauty spots where they developed attractions to lure visitors and a new phenomena, railway tourism, was born. The path was closed down during the Second World War and fell into disrepair until 2011 when the local borough council and the European Union together made seven and a half million pounds available for development. A completely redesigned path was built in 2014 and billed as the most dramatic walk in Europe. In all, it is about a three mile walk, said to be the equivalent of climbing and descending 50 flights of steps. So quite a workout to earn that spectacular views and the experience. There are 15 bridges over crashing waves about 23 feet below, a tubular tunnel 72 feet long, sunken caves to pass, and nesting birds to watch, which include one of my favorites, the puffins. 
the entire Gobbins path takes about two and a half to three hours to complete. A bit farther down the coast is a little town many here have never heard of, Downpatrick. Given how the month of March is generally given over to celebrating St. Patrick and all things Irish, that's something of a surprise. Because it's here at the Cathedral Church of the Holy Trinity, or Down Cathedral, that the remains of Ireland's patron saint reside. There are a lot of misconceptions about St. Patrick, the most prevalent of which is that he was born in Ireland, and another is that he drove snakes out of the country. Both are patently false. Snakes have never been in Ireland. Seems it's not their type of climate. And it is believed Patrick was born in North England, close to Scotland. He was kidnapped as a teen by Irish pirates and enslaved in Ireland for several years, working as a shepherd in the north of the island. He escaped, eventually making his way back to England. He later returned to Ireland to bring Christianity to the island, as per a message he'd received from an angel in a dream. He is believed to have died on March 17, 460. His remains were moved here, possibly from nearby Saul Church, where he had originally landed upon his return to Ireland. He is joined by the remains of St. Bridget, a great friend of his who was known for her charitable works, as well as St. Columba, a 6th century monk credited with spreading Christianity to Scotland and whose monastery created the elaborately detailed, handwritten and illustrated manuscript of the four Gospels of the New Testament called the Book of Kells. Downpatrick is one end of an 82-mile pilgrimage trail for devotees of St. Patrick. The Pilgrim's Walk winds through some of Northern Ireland's finest countryside and a region called the Mourne Mountains, derived from an old clan name. The Granite Range includes Northern Ireland's highest mountains, topping out at nearly 3,000 feet. The Mourns were designated in 1986 as an area of outstanding natural beauty and has been proposed as the first national park in Northern Ireland. One man said to have felt the magic of the Mourns was Belfast-born Clive Staples Lewis, or C.S. Lewis as we know him better. For him, the Mourns were a pleasure ground where he grew up in the clean Mourn air and was inspired to create the world of Narnia in his masterpiece, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I have seen landscapes in the Mourn Mountains, wrote Lewis, which under a particular light made me feel that at any moment a giant might raise his head over the next ridge. The path takes walkers between six and ten days to reach the other end, and there is another key place in St. Patrick's history. Arma, where Patrick decided to build a great stone church on what was once a very important pagan hilltop site. He finished it in 445 AD and declared Arma the center of the Church of Ireland. The, center, the Church of Ireland Cathedral now sits on the very same spot. Armagh remains to this day the religious center known as the ecclesiastical capital or Christian capital of Ireland. For an absolutely otherworldly experience, a trip to the Marble Arch Caves really delivers. In 2015, it became the world's first UNESCO global geopark that crosses an international border. Part of it lies in the southwest corner of Northern Ireland, but it stretches underground south into the Republic of Ireland. Although the limestone caves are estimated to be some 330 million years old, they weren't discovered until 1895 when two explorers investigated them. The subterranean system of large chambers and passages opened to the public nearly a hundred years later in 1985 and were named after a natural limestone archway nearby that looks like a marble stone when it's wet. Hanging stalactites, translucent mineral veils, and cascades of calcite took tens of thousands of years to grow from slow drips above through the ground into fascinating shapes and reflections. A tour of the underworld of rivers, waterfalls, winding passages, and lofty chambers takes about an hour. Continuing along the western border to the namesake town of Leek is where some of Ireland's most recognizable and delicate porcelain is created in its oldest working fine china pottery. Established in the late 1850s, Leek pottery was the brainchild of nobleman John Caldwell Bloomfield 
who reportedly inherited an estate around the time the Irish famine was coming to an end, and he wanted to provide his tenants with some form of livelihood. He happened to be an amateur mineralogist and believed components of his land would be perfect for ceramic production. Turned out he was right. When Queen Victoria took a liking to the delicate china and ordered several pieces, the company's success was guaranteed. One typical feature of Belik is a basket weave look and delicate shamrocks. When I needed a distinctive gift, usually Belik was my first choice and it was readily available in local Irish shops. Definitely not on my guest list, guest list, gift list excuse me, for anyone today is Belik's most expensive piece, a 30 inch tall urn. Called the Wolfhounds, it sold for a whopping 75,000 pounds in 2012. It is a reproduction of a China centerpiece initially created for the Paris exhibition of 1900 to showcase the pottery's quality and craftsmanship. Reportedly, it took more than 400 hours to craft. The new work was released in 2012 by Belique Pottery to mark the 155th anniversary. And it took a hand-picked team of Belique's most experienced craftsmen to over a year to create it. Unfortunately, Bloomfield died in 1897 and so did not live to see such a windfall from one of his pottery's pieces. In an ironic twist, the altruistic landowner was not a particularly good businessman and he died in poverty. Derry is one of the longest continuously inhabited places in Ireland. It was originally named for an old Irish word there or oak grove back in 546 and remained simply Derry up until 1613 when the incoming English Protestant colonists decided to rename it Londonderry. To secure their toehold in the Catholic region they built a mighty wall Almost 20 feet high and nearly as wide, the mile-long oval around the city was fortified with gates, watchtowers, battlements, bastions, and huge cannons. It was to prove a good bit of poor planning. In the late 1680s, Catholic King James II led an Irish army to capture the city. After more than 100 days of fighting without breaching the walls, British military reinforcements arrived and drove off James and his troops. Fast forward to 1921 and the truce ending the Irish War of Independence that created an Irish free state, ultimately to be known as the Republic of Ireland. With this partition of Ireland, Derry suddenly became a border city, remaining part of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. Tensions continued off and on between Catholics and Protestants, Irish and British, and eventually erupted into a violent period, euphemistically known as the Troubles. In 1969, a major riot occurred in Derry's Bogside area during an annual commemoration of the failed siege of 1689. And that riot was largely believed to have ushered in the so-called Troubles. In 1972, 14 people were killed in Derry during a clash immortalized as Sunday Bloody Sunday. The Troubles contri continued over three decades, but technically ended in 1998 with the Good Friday Agreement. Today, Derry Londonderry flourishes and memorials to both remember the horrors of the conflict as well as the beauty of peaceful coexistence are everywhere. Impossible to miss throughout town are murals blanketing buildings and walls, like a schoolgirl shown here in the lower right in the Bogside area of Derry, which is known as the Death of Innocence. The mural commemorates a young girl who was shot nearby by a British soldier. Then there's the Peace Bridge, a 771 foot long pedestrian bridge that crosses the River Foyle. It was built in 2011 as a symbol linking two sides of the same city. The two structural arms face opposite directions, visually joining communities from opposite sides of the river, the Unionist Waterside and the Nationalist Bogside. East Bank with West, Irish and British, Catholic and Protestant. The two opposed and independent arms are now united in a handshake across the river. Another symbolic handshake is embodied in a sculpture by Derry native Maurice Harron. His 1992 Hands Across the Divide depicts two eight-foot tall men reaching out to each other atop a 12-foot wall. I separated the men a bit so the hands don't meet, the artist explained, calling reconciliation an in-progress thing. 
Swinging northeast from Derry, London Derry, you come to the end of Ireland where there are beautiful Atlantic Ocean coastal beaches. According to the town of Portrush, in fact, three of the four best beaches on the entire island of Ireland are in their city. Whether in the mood for riotous arcade amusements or a quiet stroll along the shore, there's a beach for you in Portrush. But perhaps the town's biggest draw is as a starting point for some Game of Thrones fans out to seek the many backdrops used in the HBO series along the Causeway Coastal Route towards Belfast. It's easy to envision warriors on horseback racing across coastal dunes. Next up, about two miles to the east, is Dunluce Castle, a medieval abandoned castle on the top of a cliff. Its imposing look centuries after it was first built made it a prime outpost for filming. With a little help from computer-generated imagery, or CGI, it became the House Greyjoy of Pike, ruler of the mythical Iron Islands. In the case of Dunluce, its own story is just as fascinating as the fictional one built around it. Legend holds that the daughter of an early 16th century owner, Lord McQuillan, was imprisoned by her father in a tower because she refused to go through with a marriage her father had arranged for her. Of course, that was because she already had a lover. They tried to escape, but their boat dashed against the cliffs. Her body was never found, but it is said she can be seen according to some, roaming the tower's remnants calling for her man. Dunluce was also said to be the inspiration for C.S. Lewis when he wrote of the royal castle of Caer Paravel in Narnia. Dunluce's sad story was not over with the girl's tragic end. The McQuillans eventually lost the estate to the powerful MacDonald clan. In 1639, a ferocious storm pounded the fortress and it caved, literally. The entire kitchen and other parts simply broke off and tumbled to the sea below. That was a game changer for the family at the time, and they moved a bit further inland, leaving the so-called palace to ruin. The jewel of the Antrim coast is what's known as the Giant's Causeway. The 40,000 interlocking hexagonal stones date back millions of years and are the result of volcanic activity. It was the first place in the north to be awarded UNESCO World Heritage Site status in 1986. Of course, with such eye-catching look, there has to be a legend attached to it. And the story goes that it was at one time a stone bridge built by a giant between Ireland and Scotland about 15 miles away to make for easy pillaging and plundering as giants do. These stones are all that remain from that debacle. It seems to thwart the attack, the opposing giant's wife built a huge cradle, seven feet long, and her husband, dressed as a baby, crawled inside. When the invading giant saw the oversized cradle, he feared for his life, imagining how large the father must be. He ran all the way home, tearing up the bridge as he went. What is more interesting about this story than the tale itself is the basic facts. While the names are similar, the roles get reversed with different tellings. I first heard the story in Scotland, where the quick-witted wife fooled the Irish invader. However, told at the causeway, it is the Irisher who fooled the Scottish giant and sent him flying back to his home. So I guess this is a case of a choose-your-own ending story. A very popular activity, but definitely not one for the squeamish, on this coast is a jaunt across the Carrick of Reedy rope bridge. First slung across the Irish Sea from the mainland to an island ripe with migrating salmon in 1755 by local fishermen, the bridge spans a 66-foot wide chasm, some 100 feet above the water. Catches of up to 300 salmon a day were common until the 1960s, but then dwindled over time, and the last fishing done here was in about 2002. The bridge remains in use, though, for some reason, as a tourist mecca and a daredevil challenge site. There are reports of people trying handstands on top of a kitchen chair in the middle of the bridge, or riding a bike across it. It is safe to say this is one thing I will not need to experience when I get to Ireland. Getting away from the coast for a moment leads to an eerie and dramatic forest path appropriately called the Dark Hedges, a perfect place to play the role of King's Road in Game of Thrones, through which one of the stars makes a daring escape. A grove of 150 beech trees were planted in the 18th century as a grand entryway to Grace Hill House, 
and no wonder they appealed to the movie's producers. They already had their own ghost. The gray lady, nicknamed Cross Peggy, who may be Margaret, the daughter of the estate's original owner, roams through the trees at night. Perhaps she is cross because all the traffic from the Thrones fans have destroyed some of the trees, and now car traffic is banned on the pathway. Our final stop today is significant both to game fans, but to historians as well, with the quirky tribute associated with it. This is Carlock Harbor, which fans of Thrones will recognize. The stony staircase leading down to the sea was filmed as part of the free city of Bravos Canal, where a character crawled up from the waters after being stabbed in season six. What I find more interesting is tucked away on the harbor wall. It's a special memorial plaque to Patty the Pigeon. Patty was one of 30 pigeons used by the Royal Air Force during World War II to deliver coded messages across the channel during the Normandy landings of 1944. He set a record for the fastest crossing in just under five hours. His owner came from Carlock and Patty the Pigeon was given the Dickin Medal for Bravery, commonly known as the animal equivalent of the Victoria Cross. Patty lived for 11 years and is still the only Irish recipient of the medal. I hope you have enjoyed this trip to Northern Ireland on my bucket list exploration. When I finish this series, I'll post a survey form on my website for you to rate which of these destinations you think I should visit first and which has found a spot on your own bucket list. I like to end all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss. Sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. And I like to add to that to say always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. If you have any questions about this program, email me or use the contact page on my website. Of course, I also invite you to visit my website to see any of the European destinations I've already visited. When libraries are again offering in-person presentations, you can check my Programs tab to see where I'll be. And of course, visit your library site for more video vacations by Savvy Sightseer. See where in the world I'll travel to next as my bucket list continues to grow.